This meeting is being recorded. Okay, it's my great pleasure to have Professor Pushpak Bhattacharya as part of our distinguished speaker series. We had a hiatus because of the pandemic and we are starting our series. Um, uh, we've known uh, Dr. Bhattacharya for some time. Uh, I have hosted him at the Noesis uh, Center before we moved here. And uh, I also visited IIT Patna, where he was the um, more or less the first, um, you know, significant uh, director. Uh, he developed uh, a, a wonderful research culture at this important new IIT. Um, he is um, a member of the National, National Society of Engineering, and um, he's, um, you know, been elected as a fellow, uh, Abdul Kalam National Fellow, and um, also distinguished alumnus of IIT Kharagpur. He was also past president of ACL. We all know about ACL. And I think he's the most influential uh, NLP researcher in India, which is coming out very strong in AI, but also in NLP in particular. Um, and uh, he's now at uh, IIT Mumbai or Bombay, uh, but um, with strong continued collaborations nationwide, certainly with IIT Patna. So, uh, with uh, his talk title, you all seen that um, LP and society perspective from sentiment, emotion analysis and mental health monitoring. With that, um, I pass it on to Pushpak, please take over. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. So is the screen visible with the title of the talk? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so first of all, a big thank you to Amit. Uh, we know each other for a long time and I have visited Amit in his uh, research lab twice I before. And uh, I think the whole AI community, computing community knows Amit for his uh, tremendous contribution to many areas of computing. Uh, uh, you know, with, with age index of something like 84, 90, Amit is in a different class altogether. But uh, uh, I'm also very impressed by Amit's uh, warm touch to everything he does, a great group, which I visited many times, uh, two, two times before. It has been a pleasure interacting with you, Amit. Now, uh, I, men I mentioned warmth and emp empathy particularly because that is uh, the need of the hour today with a lot of progress on technology, science, and so on. Uh, the importance of humanities and social sciences is uh, felt more acutely. And uh, it is quite pleasant for us to see as natural language processing researchers that the technology of NLP uh, can contribute uh, to this endeavor to a large extent. So I'd like to talk about uh, natural language processing and its relevance to society. And uh, this, uh, these ideas and these observations, both technical and um, techno-scientific and humanities and social science oriented, originated uh, in our long standing work on sentiment and emotion analysis. I'll spend some time on building that background. And then we'll move to uh, the monitoring of mental health. I don't know if I'll have time for um, you know, talking about bias detection, but this is the plan. And uh, you can say that with our <clears throat> you know, strong results in sentiment and emotional analysis and many facets of the problem, we got more ambitious to see if uh, these techniques can be of use to mental health monitoring as a field and also to profession, professionals who deal with mental health. Now, um, let me begin with a small poem that I wrote and I have become quite fond of reciting it in uh, these days in any talk I give. So this emphasizes the synergy between scientists and engineers, 
the synergy that is needed for implementation and intuition building. Scientists ask why, engineers ask why not. Scientists wonder at what is, engineers wonder what could be. World couldn't do without either. Scientists study, engineers make, and ever the twine shall meet. So as you know, I sort of advance in my profession and uh, also become older, I do feel the critical need of marrying intuition with implementation. And this is so acutely understood in at least two uh, different facets of natural language processing. One is annotation. So those of us who have been doing NLP and teaching part of speech tagging, for example, many times sit down and wonder why there are these 39 part of speech tags in uh, the pen tag set, why there are um, you know, noun phrase, verb phrase, adjective phrase as labels on uh, tree bank data, and uh, you know what kind of uh, thinking, depth, and ingenuity went into designing these part of speech tags. Mm -hmm. So they should 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 be neither uh, too coarse nor too fine. Too fine will uh, make machine learning very difficult. Too coarse would may render them useless for downstream applications. So this. Uh, you know, deep insight into marriage of linguistics and computation, in particular linguistics and probability, is the hallmark of natural language processing. So uh, the intuition is possibly uh, coming from the language science, which is, which is linguistics, and implementation, performance, error analysis, et cetera, belong to the world of computation, data, probability, and they should interact with each other. So one part was annotation, the other part is error analysis. I have seen it again and again that without good linguistic insight, error analysis becomes extremely shallow and useless. So now uh, for the perspective of the talk and the motivation behind it, uh, we'd like to look at some data from the point of view of mental health support. So we have been involved in sentiment and emotion analysis since 2000. Initially, just basic sentiment analysis as a classification problem using statistical ML techniques like support vector machine, decision tree, and so on. And later neural techniques uh, in the form of encoder, decoder, LSTM, transformer, and so on. And uh, we have always been you know, venturing into uncharted territories where uh, uh, problems like sarcasm, thwarting, we have tackled them and uh, published them too. Now, uh, where could NLP, particularly in the area of, uh, particularly the part of NLP which deals with sentiment and emotion, could play a role in uh, uh, treatment, detection, and uh, assuaging of mental disorders, neural disorders. So uh, the data uh, speaks for itself. There are about 970 million cases of mental and neural disorders in the world. 14.3% of the deaths, approximately 8 million deaths worldwide can be traced to mental health and mental agony. So uh, the ratio of psychiatrists to patients is also a challenge. There is just one psychiatrist per 100,000 patients. And uh, support seekers often seek uh, emotional support uh, based peer to peer support platforms. Uh, people do exchange their agony, their distress, their problems. And whenever you know, such platforms data become available, they uh, are extremely useful fodder for machine learning models. Now, uh, empathy is definitely a crying need in the world today. Empathy is defined as the ability of an individual to understand another person's mental state in terms of emotions, feelings, and thoughts, which is important for an effective interpersonal interactions. Now, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, terms like emotions, feelings, and thoughts 
And uh, imagine a, a chatbot, a conversational AI agent, which is extremely mechanical and simply sticks to the objective part of the communication. Such uh, conversational AI agents are uh, actually on the way out. So chatbots are required to be contentful, informative, objective, no doubt. But as human beings who are interacting with machines, we need another layer, which is of empathy, emotion, understanding, and so on. This is a real need. I know of uh, an important airlines industry, which has approached us for uh, building that layer, that extra layer, on top of chatbots, which will make people more comfortable in their interaction with the chatbots. And uh, empathy indeed uh, is commercially important. It serves business interest, like uh, customer interaction in e-commerce, mental health support, student-teacher interaction, employer and employee, superior subordinate. Wherever there is a didactic uh, interaction, two-party interaction, empathy is real and it plays a very critical role. Now a very uh, you know, small brief on natural language processing, which we know is the art, science, and technique of making computers understand and generate language. This particular view of NLP has uh, come to stay. We begin with morphology, where we look into the internal structure of words and go to our shallow parsing in the form of part of speech tagging, chunking, deep parsing, and then uh, semantics, which deals with word meanings and semantic roles. And finally, discourse, co-reference, pragmatics, which is the layer where we deal with sentiment, emotion, and such aspects our, of our cognitive processes. NLP is also extremely multilingual, being in India, we are very much alive to this need of multilingual computation. So this is always a need. Now, uh, as a, uh, uh, from the point of view of science and technology also, multilinguality is bringing in a lot of richness into NLP effort because it affords a uh, test bed for transfer learning. So I create NLP systems for Bengali and take it to Gujarati they get to Tamil, Telugu, and so on. So there, again, linguistics plays its role in the form of uh, language closeness, syntactic similarity, morphological um, uh, closeness, and so on. There are very interesting questions when multilinguality comes in. And uh, also, very importantly, uh, sentiment and emotion are expressed quite differently in different languages and uh, cultures. A general interesting observation seems to be as we move towards the East, towards CJK countries, uh, sentiment is expressed more moderately. The choice of adjectives and adverbs are much more controlled compared to let's say in the Western part, uh, especially let's say in California and so on. So uh, what works for English uh, does, need not work for other languages like Japanese, Chinese, and even Hindi, and so on. So multilinguality is important, and all NLP questions have to be looked at afresh when the language changes. So uh, three dimensions of NLP are the following. There is language expression, uh, which is... Uh, uh, which is uh, carried on the shoulders of morphology, syntax, semantics. Content is an important uh, question because whenever there is a two-party content trans exchange, a very famous uh, set of axioms need to be fulfilled. They're called Grice's axioms, which are, uh, uh, which are foundational for any kind of meaningful uh, conversation. Grice's axioms which uh, deal with quality, quantity, relevance, and so on. And emotion, of course, is uh, the other dimension which uh, we have to deal with, and this is the main topic of the talk today. Now, I would like to uh, present to you a very interesting example of a real uh, example of uh, ambiguity and problems 
uh, arising due to this ambiguity in a two-party communication. So there is this WhatsApp exchange between two ladies, Lady A and Lady B. So there is, this is the exchange. Now Lady and Lady B both are English educated, both are Bengali native speakers. And here is a, uh, when it, uh, is a WhatsApp exchange between them. Lady A, yesterday you told me about a shop that sells artificial jewelry. Ki nam jano. So this BN slash BN is a Bengali string and uh, this is an instance of code mixing. So the meaning is, what did you say the name was? Lady B wrote back in WhatsApp, N-Y-K-A-A. -A. She was very brief. And Lady A immediately gets offended. What do you mean, madam? Is this the way to talk? And Lady B is very surprised. She asked in Bengali, Kano ki holo? Why? What happened? So Lady A did not reply. She was very angry. Now, uh, Bengali native speakers would possibly quite quickly spot what the difficulty was. The problem was the following. NYKAA, Nika is a fashion shop which is doing very well commercially. Uh, it's a hundred million US dollar industry. And Nika happens to be homophonous with a Bengali derogatory word, Naka. So Naka means somebody who feigns ignorance, innocence in a derogatory sense. And if two respectable ladies are uh, exchanging, are uh, conversing, and one of them says Naka to the other person, then uh, naturally the other person would get offended because this is a derogatory word. But what uh, Lady B meant was the fashion shop Naika, and uh, many factors coincidentally colluded to create this ambiguity. So both the ladies happen to be Bengali native speakers. The, both, both the ladies are English educated. They freely do code mixing. And the name entity called Naika was homophonous with the Naka, which is a Bengali derogatory adjective. So these four, uh, four or five factors sort of came together and created this ambiguity and breakage of communication. Now, this actually happened. And uh, this is not at all an infrequent uh, situation. It is not a rare situation. In India, we typically use two languages and many times three languages. In Bombay, Marathi, Hindi, English, all of them are used. And there is always a potential for uh, ambiguity and uh, you know miscommunication. So uh, NLP has this pro in, uh, inherent problem of ambiguity, which is sort of aggravated by multilinguality and code mixing. And it can also get aggravated if, do not, you, if uh, the communicating uh, parties do not, uh, ha, do not uh, share the same emotional level. So sentiment analysis was defined very well uh, as a five tuple uh, consideration where the third entity S is the sentiment. This is of primary importance. The sentiment is expressed for an entity with respect to a particular feature F, and the opinion is held by a person H at a time T. Because the sentiment can change over time, sentiment can differ from opinion holder to opinion holder. Sentiment can differ across features. You may like the dance sequence in a movie, but not so much the acting. And the entity itself is something of interest. Let's say a movie is of interest. But the most important entity is S. Now, identifying the correct sentiment of an utterance is actually a classical machine learning problem. Now, sentiment is a typically three class uh, classification problem, positive, negative, and neutral. But uh, we know that uh, that is uh, hardly sufficient, uh, sufficient because within positive sentiment, I might want to know, is there uh, joy or what degree of joy? Was there joy mixed, uh, mixed with surprise? Or was it also joy mixed with a bit of sadness maybe? So human emotion the landscape is very complex and full of surprises, twists and turns. So Wheel of Emotion was proposed by Platchik. It's a very ingenious um, uh, device 
which uh, affords extremely interesting and rich computational problems. So uh, in this wheel of emotions, we see eight basic emotions, which is different from an earlier work by Ekman, which proposed six basic emotions. And before that, in Indian uh, art tradition, Navarasa, the nine, uh, base, nine emotions used by actors, dancers, and so on. So there are these eight basic emotions like joy, trust, fear, anticipation, and so on. Now, the interesting uh, part of this framework is that as we move towards the center, the intensity of the emotion increases. For example, joy becomes ecstasy. And uh, as we move towards the circumference, the intensity decreases. For example, joy becomes serenity. Not only that, between two petals, you have what is called combination emotion. For example, uh, joy plus trust gives rise to love. Uh, trust and fear gives rise to submission and uh, so on. So this is a, uh, an extremely rich framework, giving opportunity for very interesting uh, computational work, which uh, some of which we also have undertaken in our lab and got interesting results. Uh, Pushpak, can I ask yeah. a question here? Please, please, yeah. Yeah, my question is that uh, this wheel of this is Biplov. Uh, this yeah. uh, wheel of emotion um, is this a engineering view, or there is also a psychological view? Is this uh, felt by animals also, or is it only humans? Is it just by? Uh, has it been verified in the psychology literature? Okay, this is a completely uh, psychology view. Plachik himself was a very well known and well established psychologist. Now, uh, as is the case for many uh, human activities, including, um, you know, including parsing, where you take the mental processes and try to algorithmize them on uh, computational platforms. Now, coming to your question of, of has this been verified for uh, animals? I really don't know, but uh, what, what has been verified is that human beings have more complex uh, layers of emotion and more complex combinations of emotions. I can be simultaneously uh, joyful and sad, okay? So uh, most probably the layers and strata of emotion are much more complex for human beings. But this view is a completely psychological view. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe you just, an this is Michael Humes, excuse me. Maybe you just answered this, but it seems like there's other combinations just uh, in addition to the pairs that are shown. So I yeah. can imagine, uh, you know, rage and terror being combined, uh, even though they're not next to each other, they're opposed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So does this model um, admit that or is, uh, or does it not? Uh, so uh, so your, your question actually is, all the, all the combination emotions that we see between the petals, uh, you, you're saying that it is, I can imagine, you or any of us can imagine other combinations also as possibility. So most probably yes, but you see this is a very classic diagram, okay, 1982, and it has been extensively used in psychology. So uh, we have sort of gone by what, what psychologists tell us. Maybe other combinations are possible, but uh, I don't think uh, the computational systems have been built which make use of, uh, which propose and make use of other combinations. Okay, so yeah. um, I would suggest that for a computational system, what would be better is an algebra of um, emotions and their combinations. And yes. uh, which could be formally defined and computationally implemented. Uh, right. So uh, I, maybe I'd like to point to you that uh, two, two or three years back, we uh, undertook this activity of uh, you know, looking upon each of these emotions as points in a multidimensional sp space. So we, we would call them emotion embeddings. Uh, not word, uh, like, um, you know, word embeddings, we would have emotion embeddings. And then see if uh, joy and trust 
are close to the embedding of love. How do we get these embeddings? We look upon these emotions as expressed by those words. So get the word embedding of love, get the word embedding of joy and trust and see if, uh, if there are combinations. Let's say vector addition is close to the vector of love. So we took some you know, naive simple exercise and uh, I would, uh, I would wholeheartedly support your proposal too. That means you take embeddings which are um, not proposed in this flat check emotion and take their combinations and see where you get. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Then we have also uh, seen that uh, in sentiment and emotion analysis, Gradually, uh, uh, multitasking, multimodality, multilinguality are uh, asserting themselves. So multimodality has become very important, especially for sarcasm detection. So if you look at these uh, exchange, passenger, thank you for sending me to Delhi and my luggage to Mumbai. Brilliant service. Now, a chatbot, which is very unsophisticated, very naive, very crude, let's say, might come back with this response, thanks for the appreciation, and that will make the passenger all the more mad. Look at the body language of the, uh, of the person who says, oh, wow, well done, which is positive sentiment, but the body language is extremely negative. So this is one characteristic of uh, sarcasm. There are always two signals who are in opposition to uh, each other. It may be a textual signal, or maybe you know multimodal signal. So your body language and text are two different modalities of signal, and they're in opposition to each other. So this is uh, we call this incongruity, and a lot of our sarcasm research is based on a computational modeling of incongruity. Some of which I'll touch upon. So we have also been able to you know, uh, introduce uh, or create a system which makes the output of a chatbot more humane, um, a little more empathetic by introducing politeness. Okay. And uh, all these activities take place in our uh, laboratory now called Computation for Indian Language Technology. There are four associated fa faculty members and at any point of time, there are uh, 30 to 40 researchers, students, administrators associated with the lab. So gradually this has uh, come to be uh, a very well-known setup for natural language processing research, quite well-known in the country and outside the country too. Okay, so now uh, we I first take up a very difficult problem, the problem of sarcasm detection. Uh, one of my PhD students, Aditya Joshi, uh, his PhD thesis was on sarcasm, computational sarcasm detection. We could make inroads into sarcasm detection. And that happened because we uh, uh, went into the uh, nitty gritties or the dynamics of what creates sarcasm. And indeed, we traced it to uh, incongruity, incongruity of two signals. And uh, by the way, the, so incongruity is at the heart of not only sarcasm, but it is also at the heart of the metaphor, hyperbole, irony, uh, humor, rumor, fake news. Many, many situations are actually uh, traceable to the presence of incongruity. So this is a very foundational uh, concern. And Aditya did a good job of really investigating it deeply and um, creating computational uh, systems out of it. Uh, Pushpak, this yeah. idea of in incongruity yeah. is very important. Um, uh, we are uh, we, we stumble across that uh, in another context, uh, that of yeah. fake news, for example. Uh, yeah. Is there anything specific you can point me to about um, uh, concretely defining incongruity and any computational uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess realization of uh, detecting incongruity, which kind of then lead us to other things like sarcasm, like fake news and other things. Yeah, so I'll come to a very simple uh, solution and uh, maybe then come back to your question. 
okay. is coming sure. coming Thanks. forward. Hmm. Yeah. So okay, so sentiment analysis we know is a three class problem: a positive, negative, and neutral. And uh, uh, it is uh, uh, it is also known that sentiment analysis can be done in uh, you know addressing a number of dimensions. So sentiment analysis uh, can be multilingual, and the techniques can be many, like statistical techniques, deep learning techniques, reinforcement learning based techniques. Then uh, the uh, the NLP tasks are uh, of various nature, very diverse tasks. Sentiment analysis is one of them. Now we can bring in human cognitive signals in the form of eye tracking. So that uh, forms uh, the last part of my talk. If I find time, then I'll get there. So uh, natural language processing has this task definition, dimension, languages dimension, technique dimension, and now, also the cognitive signal dimension. Now the word sarcasm comes from the Greek word uh, sarcasmos, which means to tear flesh with teeth. And the Sanskrit uh, etymology says, uh, the equivalent word is vakrokti, a twisted utterance. So both of these definitions touch upon two critical um, you know, elements of sarcasm. First of all, sarcasm is meant to injure. It is meant to hurt. Sarcasm is a kind of irony, but irony can be harmless, but sarcasm is always hurtful. And Sanskrit uh, definition says that sarcasm has two different facets. There is a surface uh, signal and there is a deeper signal, and they are uh, many times in opposition to each other. Now, uh, irony is the background from which uh, sarcasm is um, created. An allied concept, uh, which is opposite of sarcasm, is humble bragging. If somebody says, oh, my life is miserable, I have to sign 500 autographs a day, most probably this person is boasting about his or her stature, uh, but saying that my life is miserable, which is, again, a, an example of incongruity life being miserable and signing of 500 autographs. The, the, the misery may actually happen going forward when a person has become famous and has to really sign lots of autographs every day, day after day. But uh, if, in the initial part of one's career, if somebody is saying this, then it's called humble bragging. It is opposite of sarcasm. Now, there are different kinds of sarcasm. The most uh, uh, common is propositional sarcasm. This has to be understood as sarcastic in a context. This looks like a perfect plan can be can come in a sequence of dialogue turns. And uh, if, if this is not a praise, but actually a sarcastic statement, this has to be understood from the context. So propositional sarcasm appears most of the time in a dialogue context. Embedded sarcasm is uh, inherent in the statement itself. And here the incongruity is seen within the same sentence. So if somebody went to a party and the host didn't, and nobody paid any attention to the pers person, while leaving, if the host comes and uh, asks the person, how did you like the party? The person bitterly says, I love being ignored. That's a sarcastic statement. And it's an example of what is called embedded sarcasm. Like preface sarcasm also appears many times. I'm talking about English. So like you care often in, uh, signals the presence of sarcasm. And in today's multimodal NLP, elocutionary sarcasm is the problem which is handled using multiple modalities. So if somebody shrugs the shoulders and says it's very helpful indeed, that's an example of elocutionary sarcasm. Shrugging of shoulder is negative but very helpful indeed is a positive sentiment. Now, uh, this is an example of elocutionary sarcasm. Now, we undertook uh, our investigations into sarcasm prompted by the following observation. That sarcasm, presence of sarcasm immediately brings down the accuracy of a sentiment analysis system. Okay, it, it falls drastically. So here is an example of a set of numbers here. 
there are uh, two uh, uh, publicly available tools, Meaning Cloud and LNTK uh, Sentiment Analysis System. So in, in case of non-sarcastic text, the accuracy is about 50 for Meaning Cloud and 81 for NLTK for conversational transcripts. When it comes to tweets, the accuracies are 50 and 69. But the moment sarcastic text is taken up, the accuracy falls by about half. 50 to 20, 81 to 38, and 50 to 17, 69 to 35. It falls drastically. So when we observe this, we thought that even if sarcasm is a rare phenomenon, it has to be taken seriously because its weightage may be high in many different situations. So accuracy fall, a drastic accuracy fall is a problem, is a general problem for sentiment analysis when it comes to tackling sarcasm. Now, uh, though sarcasm is rare, and so, uh, that, which means that uh, the data for training a machine learning model is difficult to obtain, which is a challenge, but sarcasm comes with very strong clues. So use of laughter expression, haha, you are very smart, for example, your intelligence astounds me, LOL, heavy punctuation, protein shake for dinner, double exclamation, great, then tri triple exclamation, use of emoticons, yeah, use of interjections, use of capital letters. These are very strong signals. And we note as NLP researcher that these are pragmatic signals. So, you know, your intelligence astounds me is the proper text, English text. And it has semantics, syntax, morphology, all built into it. But LOL is an extra linguistic signal. And that is a meta information, which is capturing the pragmatics of the situation. So uh, sentiment analysis, sarcasm, irony, they take us into the pragmatic layer of natural language processing. Now, uh, incongruity is really at the heart of things. I love being ignored, has inbuilt incongruity. But the incongruity need not be expressed through explicit sentiment bearing words. 3 a.m. at work, EAEA. EAEA -E 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 is an expression of delight. But working at 3 a.m., is that a delightful situation? No. So that's a, a case of implicit incongruity, okay? Up all night coughing, negative situation, yummy, which is a positive expression. No power, yes, yes, thank you, Storm. This phone has an awesome battery backup of two hours. That is also a sarcastic situation. So the, the incongruity can be explicit and implicit, and how do we deal with it is a question which we have some solution, propose some solution. So explicit incongruity is overtly expressed, implicit is covertly expressed. I love this paper so much that I made a doggy bag out of it. So I made a doggy bag out of it is not an explicit negative uh, uh, phrase, but if a research paper gets turned into a doggy bag, we can understand the sarcasm inherent in the statement. And sarcasm also is affected by sense ambiguity, which makes the complex more uh, problem more complex. Oh, it is so nice of you to give me a ring early in the morning. Now, uh, it depends on the meaning of ring, uh, in meaning of ring uh, and uh, whether there is sarcasm or not. So if the ring is a phone call, then it is sarcastic. It is so nice of you to give me a ring early in the morning. And if ring means a gold ring and a piece of ornament, then it is not uh, sarcastic, okay? So word senses and sarcasm also interact, which is an in a nice interaction between semantics and pragmatics, okay? So we all are uh, quite, uh, you know, excited by this kind of interaction between semantics and pragmatics. Pushpak, we would have, uh, the humans would have uh, 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 kind of general common sense knowledge or uh, other specific knowledge. So. Uh, right. It's uh, quite likely that the ring here is a phone ring. Uh, very, very unlikely it's a gold ring. Um, yes. And um, that knowledge humans would have it. Uh, yeah. Are you going to discuss the incorporation of specific concrete knowledge in this situation? Yes, I mean... So, if because I, without I'm... that, I doubt you can solve this very well. Yes, of course, of course. You need more context, yes. 
And if not context, if not uh, completely resolved with certainty, then probability. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is likely that uh, here the embedding and the probability will favor the uh, phone call sense. So, so your example of working at 3 a.m. Yeah. Uh, it's perfectly fine in terms of you know 3 a.m. and uh, all the language features, but uh, working at 3 a.m. is a, a thing that uh, comes only from uh, some general knowledge, right? Or some other yeah. thing external saying that people are not supposed to work at the sleeping time. Uh, yes. And there is a sleeping time or some such thing. Um, right. So where does that get in? And how do you find uh, that the system has access to all the relevant knowledge as we humans would? Right. So, um, okay. So um, you see, first of all, uh, now we, the whole community takes it very seriously to integrate knowledge graph with the deep learning systems. Okay. So, in <coughs> sorry. So it is very commonplace to see uh, deep learning systems integrated with ConceptNet, FrameNet, RobBank. So these kind of knowledge structures which store common sense knowledge. And the uh, other kind of signal is this. Uh, uh, 3 a.m. at work, how many times it has been marked as a negative sentence, negative sentiment, okay, in in, in the corpus by which the machine learning model that is. Seems very, that is very inefficient, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, have enough uh, content of, uh, you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., right. whatever. That would be very, you know, uh, you know, low uh, occurrence, and hence very unlikely that you'll have sufficient uh, support from any annotations. So, you know, no, not not really, not really. I, I would like to, you know, mention to you our recent, you know, uh, experience of dealing with LLMs, hmm. extremely large language models. Hmm. So there are things like, you know, a Bloom GPT three, GPT three uh, does very well. So what happens there is that. Uh, I have given prompts, okay, prompts to the large language model in the form of normal sentence to metaphorical sentences. So the building is very tall. The metaphorical equivalent is the building is sky high. Mm. I am very sad today. I am down. I am down in the um, uh, dumps. Mm. So normal to metaphorical, metaphorical to normal. Just give a few such prompts to the large language model. And it begins to generate metaphorical uh, sentences for new normal sentences. Mm. Okay, it begins to generate that. So large language models are actually, you know, showing some wonderful performance. And uh, I'm I'll not be surprised if you take, uh, let's say, uh, a Bloom with three hundred billion parameters, and you give it these, you know, a few prompts here, and then it will begin to spot this. Uh, sarcastic or non-sarcastic. Okay, so this is happening, and rare when you say rare occurrence, rare occurrence for small uh, or even medium-sized corpus. But these large language models are un using unimaginably uh, large amount of corpus. Yeah, so one just quick point, Pushpak sir here. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Deep, I mean, sarcasm detection have been a great problem for you know many years. And yeah. a lot of people did well. Then sarcasm explanation. And surprisingly, GPT-3 mm. is doing excellent. Even we tried with the Memotion data and et cetera. So mm. explanation with the prompt base is actually growing, going great. So, yeah. so any, you know, uh, how surprisingly all this language model doing it, people started calling it now emerging capabilities of language model. So your yes. comment, any comment here? So, uh... So large language models, you know, uh, I think the prompt engineering is uh, is emerging as a very powerful technique. And in prompt engineering, of course, also requires uh, good linguistic insight as well as task specific insight, because what should be the prompts? Okay, does the prompt, do the prompts actually cover the whole conceptual space? They have to be carefully designed. So, uh, 
so the so the fact that you know these powerful machine learning techniques are using huge amount of corpus actually unimaginably large amount of corpus that is uh, working wonders so so uh, is your question a large language model why are they able to generate explanations is that the question yeah so so now new term people coined up in the NLP community is called emerging capabilities of language models I mean, right. uh, which are not being taught to language model, but they are able to do it, and we don't know yeah. why. So, any, any, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no. So we also don't know. We yeah. are, for example, for this metaphor, metaphor generation, we, 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 we still have no explanation as to why is it able to do it. Mm. Okay, so a lot of people say that this is doing prefix uh, completion. So, the normal sentence is coming as a prefix, and the metaphorical statement is a kind of sen uh, prefix completion. Okay, but we really don't know. I don't, I don't think the community also knows the answer very well. Yeah, so, so that's my question to you is, you know, what's your thought process? Because sometimes we don't able to answer to even students, it is doing, but why it is doing, we have no answer. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't think I also have the answer completely. I only, uh, the, 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 my line of the investigation and analysis is uh, in prefix completion. Maybe that is the clue, but I really don't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you do this, how do you uh, deal with the situation that this person has a night shift? Uh, the person. Oh, okay. So, so I mean, then see, I think your um, questions are all pertaining to one important uh, fact. That fact is that um, uh, the model is as good as the data. Okay, just as good as the data. So. Uh, so that's why I said, if there is a strong correlation in the data about uh, 3 a.m. at work being bad, okay, the, the, the system doesn't know bad or good. The system only knows that there is a strong correlation between negative sentiment and 3 a.m. at work. It could be 1 a.m. also. And so, so and I'll show you some, some of our work on numerical yeah, I, I, I just yeah. want to mention this. Uh, we probably want to move ahead, but um, yeah. I'm drawn back to things that I really uh, uh, like. Uh, Pedro Dominguez wrote in his uh, 2012 paper on machine learning that data alone yeah. is not enough. And, yes. yes. Uh, and so all of these things, you know, my my, tip, my questions are typically uh, inspired by the fact that uh, data will solve certain problems very well, and good to see that this so-called emerging yeah. capabilities of language models uh, can do X, Y, Z, these things. And, right. But, um, you know, just the same way the sarcasm is not so exception. I mean, it occurs quite often. The same way, I think that things that are beyond data occur reasonably often. And uh, I think uh, depending upon the problem you choose, I think you'll still come out quite short with large language model. But we'll... we'll uh, yeah, I will, will say. So I'm not saying that data is the solution to everything. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that the model is just as good as the data. Okay, sure. and uh, the emerging, uh, uh, you know, emerging properties out of the data that uh, takes us to things like natural language inferencing, entailment, and uh, so on. And of course, uh, this is a very serious endeavor. I mean, integrating. Uh, knowledge structures with deep learning we ourselves are doing for many domain specific problems and this is a very serious business these days yes, yes. okay so let's uh, so so i i come to one one of the questions that amit had asked how does one model in congruity so we gave a solution and it was uh, so simple and worked pretty well that it got uh, covered in this mit technology review in 2016 and there was also a mention of this in um, in uh, Times London edition and also in CSEM. So yeah, this was a paper in AMNLP 2016. So, uh, so first of all, unigrams are, have always proven to be a very faithful features for any NLP task. So we retain unigrams for sarcasm detection. Then pragmatic uh, signals on the text like capitalization, emoticons, punctuation marks, etc., which I mentioned are very strong signals for sarcasm. Then implicit uh, incongruity and explicit incongruity. So those uh, are the features which uh, we obtain from lexical resources. A lot of details there. Um, 
so the, when these features are used, then we found that in many different uh, benchmark data sets like tweets and discussion forum, we could beat the state of the art accuracies. So that was a consistent uh, observation and which is what led to a publication of uh, sarcasm detection in a number of uh, top level fora. Now our solution to capturing incongruity was simply cosine similarity based. Okay, you might, one might call it very, very naive, but it worked. So we used the similarity of word embeddings. So this sentence was there in the corpus. A man needs a woman like a fish needs a bicycle. So this was marked as a sarcastic sentence from a standard benchmark corpus. Now, what is the signal here? For a human being, you see the signal is this. Fish and bicycle, hardly any similarity. Man and woman, lot of similarity. Now we consider the property, linguistic property of like as a preposition. Like as a preposition links two uh, phrases or two sentential segments. Now like has the property that the properties of the left of the text to the left of like and to the right of like should be same. So now we uh, now investigate a property called similarity. So to the left of like, I have a man needs a woman. Here I find that man and woman have high similarity value in terms of cosine similarity of embeddings. To the right, I have fish needs bicycle. Fish and bicycle have very low similarity, okay? And we say that uh, here incongruity is present. That's all. And this incongruity um, has uh, served because we get good uh, results making use of some amount of embellishment on this basic idea. And uh, we, we see that our figures, are, uh, which makes use of incongruity, are always better than the state of the art. Okay, so this was, this I think caught the com attention of the community um, and was reported in quite uh, prestigious forum. So this is the answer to your question, Amit. I mean, one answer that incongruity is modeled by means of embeddings and their similarity. Okay. Uh, excuse me. In that example, did you also include the uh, similarity between the other pairs uh, from man to fish, woman to fish, man to bicycle, woman to bicycle? Um, no, because we were constrained by the uh, restrictions imposed by the preposition like. Okay. So okay. like is like is like a barrier which uh, this allows comparing similarity to man and fish and woman and bicycle. One more, modi you. one more modifier in this could all break up, break, break down. No, sorry, what is that? There may be some modifier here and this may ah. not work, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, again, a very, uh, very big thorn in the place for NLP. A negation, for example, actually can derail the model uh, intensifiers in the form of adjectives and adverbs also can color the decision of the machine learning model. Yes, yes. Modifiers and negative particles, hardly, not, never, these things also influence the models. Okay. So, uh, so this was uh, an indication of how to capture incongruity, but there are more sophisticated techniques which can be used. Now we come to a kind of sarcasm, which is all the more difficult. So this we call numerical sarcasm, and it has the following form. This phone has an awesome battery backup of 38 hours. This is non-sarcastic, and in, in fact, it is positive sentiment. This phone has a terrible battery backup of two hours, which is a direct negative sentiment and non-sarcastic. Now this phone has an awesome battery backup of two hours is sarcastic because two hours of battery backup is not awesome. So now uh, this also as a digression leads to the interesting question, why people would prefer three to two? Now there are interesting you know, theories about it. There is uh, this notion of uh, dramatization of conversation, forceful articulation, which are communication needs. But there is a third intrig intriguing possibility, which is very, thought provoking. So sarcasm, what it does is that it operates by first lowering the defense and then attacking. 
which is why the heart is much more uh, cruel, much more cruel and much more intense. So sarcasm first makes a positive st st statement, lowers the defense, and then comes the negative part of the uh, statement. Okay, that, that that attack is much more lethal. So uh, now, uh, for numerical sarcasm, we again had some benchmark data sets. And I, I forgot to mention that in all these uh, experiments, we took care to work with both unbalanced and balanced data. So sarcasm is a, a, a rare phenomenon. Therefore, the data set with respect to sarcasm is often difficult to find. So anyway, we worked, we worked with benchmark data. And we first had a strategy which is naive, okay, to, uh, to say the least. So I love, I love writing this paper at 9 a.m. And this matched a sarcastic tweet. I love writing this paper daily at 3 a.m. This was in the data. Now, 9 is not close to 3. Therefore, the test tweet is non-sarcastic. So this was a rule-based system. Now, immediately, one would jump up and say, why, why do you say 9 it, 9 is not close to 3? What do you mean by close? OK, one more example. I am so productive when my room is 81 degrees. It matched a non-sarcastic tweet. I am very much productive in my room as it has 21 degrees. Absolute difference between 81 and 21 is high. Therefore, the test tweet is sarcastic. So we wanted to tackle the problem of numerical sarcasm where the sarcasm originates in numbers. Okay, And we have to take the numerical difference, distance, et cetera. We have that notion. So whenever we, uh, so this, this kind of rule-based system actually produced some impressive accuracy compared to the state of the art. And so this encouraged us, our, us to send the write-up for publication. And referees always came back saying, this is so ad hoc. What do you mean by nine is not close to three and 81 is close to 100 and so on? This is very, very ad hoc. So then we decided that, OK, that we can remove this ad hocism by asking the data to decide uh, this closeness. So uh, we take data and made, made use of some classical machine learning techniques and uh, made use of various kinds of sentiment analysis features. And uh, we could get uh, an accuracy of about 0.83, which is close to the rule-based system. But here again, we have objections because the feature engineering is again in the hand of human beings. So forget everything and go to a deep learning system where there is hardly any feature engineering. It is end to end. And there are various hyperparameters. So there we got uh, results in the range of 90s for the data set that was given. And that was uh, finally published after many rejections where the main objection was things are so ad hoc. Feature engineering is ad hoc. Distance measures are ad hoc. But deep learning system, there is no dependence on anything human. The data completely decides everything. So this is the way we uh, dealt with uh, numerical sarcasm. And I think this is the only paper we saw in numerical sarcasm data. How did you deal with the issue of uh, uh, comment about ad hoc? Issue of what? You said you, the, you had difficulty in publishing because the reviewers thought it was ad hoc. Yeah, the initial two uh, kind, two approaches, rule-based and uh, classical machine learning. But in the deep learning system, since we removed all human intervention, mm. our referees, I think, were happy. <laughs> yeah. Because the data is giving you the signal of these differences, etc. So now I come to some applications of our, you know, long-standing experience of dealing with uh, sentiment, sarcasm, thwarting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So towards an end-to-end -end motivational dialogue system and application of sentiment analysis and natural language generation to mental health. So uh, this was uh, this year's uh, to, uh, N -N NACL paper. And uh, this was Tulika was the PhD student who got jointly guided by me and Shri Parna. Now, uh, of course, we have seen there is this global burden of mental health, uh, st sh severe shortage of mental health professional. One is 200,000. So we do need virtual agents. Now, what we wanted to do was that uh, can we train a virtual agent with uh, the exchange of uh, you know uh, information between a professional and a patient or between patients, okay? So one thing we uh, were careful not to claim is that these are not prescriptions. These are simply mental helps 
some positive statement, some encouraging statement, which sometimes is effective to bring a pa patient back from the precipice. Okay, a person who is about to commit suicide, if this person gets some encouraging statement, if a ray of light from somewhere, maybe this person will pull back from committing suicide. Okay, that was the main motivation. So uh, one of the contributions was creation of two data sets. It is called, they're called Motivate and Counsel VA. And they uh, consist of dialectic uh, conversations for depression, multiple mental illnesses between users, and uh, the virtual agent, which is prepared with actual conversations collected from mental health fora. So these fora were open and they said that you can use this data for research purposes. So there are uh, all different kinds of uh, mental disorders, which I'll go into very, very soon. But uh, we also made use of you know, transformer-based systems and some techniques which were, uh, which were frequently used by people for all kinds of machine learning techniques. GPT-2 model was used at the time. So here is some information on the data. This can be used by researchers. They're open and they're available for research purposes. 5,000 dyadic uh, conversations amounting to a total of 18,000 utterances between depressed users and virtual assistant, virtual agent imparting appropriate suggestion, hope, and motivation. And council VA, there were about, again, uh, 4,000 uh, two-party conversations, but there were important uh, mental disorder categories. MDD, major depressive disorder, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. So these are some of the data sets. Uh, these are from actual conversations. So a person called Unwanted, I think the names are anonymized in that platform. My 17 year old son, son got mad, should have been spelt mad and threw, threw some things at me. So this is another uh, feature of these kind of conversations. They're almost always noisy. They have grammatical spelling mistakes. And then uh, uh, virtual agent says, you are not a bad person. You did what you felt was best for you and your son. Don't let what your husband tell you to get to you, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some encouraging you know, positive uh, statements, which are not, uh, again, prescriptions. They are not clinical suggestions. They are simply statements. Now, what is the challenge and problem here? The problem and the challenge and problem is to choose an appropriate encouraging statement, okay? so. Uh, if the uh, if the statement is is excessive guilt associated with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, I feel guilty about things that happened. Now here the response has to be appropriate. Okay, uh, maybe you can say you are not a bad person, but there can be better responses. Yes, people with OCD often feel an excessive guilt. Have you been diagnosed with OCD? One possible thing to do is to ignore our annoying thoughts, but if that doesn't work for you, maybe you could try other methods. Okay, we're not prescribing any medicine, that would be dangerous. We can, do not want to take the clinician's job onto our hand, but just simply give encouraging statement. But the challenge is to choose the correct statement. Okay, there can be multiple uh, ways of encouraging. You choose the most appropriate one and also introduce a bit of diversity. The same patient, when come the person come, ne comes next time to the VA, should have some diversity in the responses. So technical details are usual suspects, like there are these deep learning models and classifiers with layers and layers of neuron doing various things. We'll not go into those details now. And uh, uh, we made use of metrics like blue rules, et cetera, for, um, for the appropriateness of the response produced by the virtual agent. So virtual agent takes turn to respond to the patient, okay? So choosing that correct turn is the, uh, is the main NLP and machine learning problem. So we measured accuracy with respect to gold standard data and our model had uh, you know, slightly better accuracy than a number of other models which we ourselves trained, okay? And uh, these are BART and CNN combination, BART, CNN with sentiment combination and different models, okay? And uh, we also uh, uh, looked at the response generation, where we found that this GPT-2-based model with a little bit of re reinforce, uh, reinforcement learning produced uh, figures 
which are better than other models work. So baselines were ours because we did not have any other work done in this area by any other group. So we, we essentially tried various models and said that this combination is good. So model building and data set contribution, that is where the main uh, pieces uh, of work I here. I think uh, yeah. we are, uh, you know, way beyond one, uh, one hour. So oh, okay. maybe just uh, summarize yeah, what, me, what we are missing yeah. and... Uh, yeah, uh, then let me just uh, summarize. So uh, we did another piece of work, which was in uh, calling this time. And this is AI and ML for mental distress. And this is for, uh, uh, you know, detecting the personality type from suicide notes. Mm. So this was uh, work by, um, um, this was work by, one minute, uh, student. Um, Ghosh, uh, his first name I'm forgetting now. Okay, uh, Ghosh, uh, myself, and Iqbal. So he is a, also a PhD student at Patna. So a you know, lot of a uh, lot of our experience of sentiment emotion I uh, took to uh, Patna, and uh, fortunately there were uh, good students working on uh, different kinds of sentiment emotion analysis problems, and there application. So this is something we did and uh, this was for uh, personality type detection and we wanted to make statements like this personality type is more prone to suicides. Okay, so this was uh, done and I'm not, I don't have time to go into it. And the final part is we made use of eye tracking features for uh, sentiment detection. And here we could uh, show that by making use of these cognitive signals, and that came from some interesting um, study of annotations. So annotators always have rapid uh, movement of eye uh, back and forth if the sentence is sarcastic. Okay, for a normal sentence, you see a more or less linear progression over the words. But in sarcasm, I always moves back and forth. So we capture those signals from eye tracking devices, and that led to a very uh, you know significant improvement in accuracy. So that was in ACL. So these uh, cognitive signals were also exploited by us for uh, high accuracy sentiment analysis systems. And we also learned uh, different uh, weightages for uh, eye tracking signals and textual signals. So let me uh, then summarize and conclude. Uh, there is a definite case for creation of virtual agents for mental health, mainly because of the scarcity of mental health professionals. And we do need uh, the techniques and um, uh, scientific underpinnings of natural language processing, sentiment and emotion. We could undertake uh, you know, these kind of applications because of our long experience in sentiment and emotion. Uh, sarcasm is a very difficult problem. We did make inroads and in fact, some of the early papers on sarcasm is by us. And uh, the review paper on sarcasm is highly cited, um, Aditya's and mine. So the, we created a virtual agent for mental health. We call it an agony art, which gives you encouragement in times of distress. And another important piece of work is correlating personality types with suicide notes. There has been huge amount of work on personality type detection. This is called MBTI measure. And due to a celebrated psychologist called Jung. So we did uh, you know, link uh, suicide with personality types. And that was a... Uh, a pretty you know well appreciated piece of work so of course the challenges are absence of data the agent should be factual consistent and non hallucinating we should grapple with a lot of pragmatic ambiguity like sarcasm irony metaphor etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, so the vmh virtual agent for mental health is the need of the hour model building goes hand in hand with data creation whenever we create data we contribute it so that's an important progress for research. But we need strong theoretical background based on behavioral study, which we have done extensively, starting from cognitive study of incongruity, coming up to personality types, suicide, suicide notes study, all this have been done. We have contributed those data also. And we have been interacting with mental health professionals with different kinds of experiences. Some of the professionals are very encouraging. Some say that no, no, what is all this? AI cannot uh, you know, make inroads into these problems. And we need fine classification of mental health disorders. 
and uh, we assure the reassure the doctors that we are creating an assistant and not a competitor okay thank you thank you for your attention everything i said is linked from my home page also from my labs home page and uh, i'll be happy to take up any comment or question of course we are yeah thank you very time. much uh, pushwak as always very very um, insightful talk uh, plenty of things to learn from plenty of things for us to follow up it so happens that there are you know quite a few overlap in terms of at least the problems we are solving trying to right. solve and uh, what you've been working on in fact uh, at uh, 11 o'clock it is currently 11 15 uh, there was scheduled we had scheduled a meeting uh, about our own uh, ongoing work on mental health uh, chatbots. Oh wow! Um, oh, so nice. And uh, one of the uh, one of the what unique area that we are addressing is that of safety. Um, uh, uh, so patient safety, and uh, again, uh, empathy would be an important point for the for us to consider there. Um, this has been great. There are some questions that people have, but I think in terms of time, I will. Uh, like to conclude this. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Everyone, I'm glad you joined, and so much more to learn. Uh, this presentation, um, uh, you know, should be available to us. So I'll post that, and um, uh, so you'll have. And, and Amit, they can they can write to me. They can email to me for their questions. I'll be Perfect. happy to answer. Perfect. There are some questions. I will ask them to email those to you. And yeah, yeah. Uh, great. You. Okay. Um, I'm.